All right, so despite the maths of Uranus and Neptune kind of suggesting there was something big, and then it turns out it's actually not right, we did find something. It just was Pluto, and Pluto is a bit weird. It's too small, right? Yes, yeah, so let's look at its orbit. So here we've got Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto in yep. their orbits. And if you remember, all the planets are in, I mean, they're elliptical orbits, but as we showed earlier, they're so, so damn near circular, right. you can't really tell the difference. But look at the orbit of Pluto. Yeah, I can already see that's not right. I mean, this is really far apart, and now what's well, almost kind of closer than Neptune at some point. It does come closer than Neptune. So while on average it's further out, it spends a fraction of its orbit closer in. So sometimes it is closer to the Sun than Neptune. Yeah, it's definitely a highly elliptical orbit, unlike um, uh, every, every other planet. Because I remember when we explored this previously, I couldn't really tell the difference between the perfect circle and the not perfect circle. And if you look at it from side on, so now looking at the orbit side on, again I've got Uranus and Neptune, and now looking at Pluto, you remember all the other planets right. are in the same plane, the ecliptic, which was presumably the plane of the original disk. But again, look at Pluto. So, so not only is this coming closer and like this, it's doing this kind of weird inclin inclined orbit. Yeah, now there's something else that we've seen that had inclined orbits and elliptical orbits. Oh yeah, we did. It was the asteroids. That's right. So, Wait, this isn't an asteroid, is it? No, but it's behaving a bit like it. Yeah, it kind of. Um, and so, okay. and of course, there's not just one asteroid, there's a lot. That's true. So people have started thinking, maybe there are more things like Pluto. Maybe there's a Pluto belt, or there's other Pluto-like things out there, just like there's an asteroid belt, yep. all of which have these elliptical inclined orbits. Okay. And how do you discover it? I mean, the trouble is these things are going to be pretty damn faint. I mean, they got lucky with discovering Pluto with photographic plates, but more photographic plate studies have not found more of these things. That's right. Um, it just so happened that this fake prediction happened to give you the location of it. So they're going to be faint, but they're also not even going to be in the same plane. They're not going to be in the same type of circular or circular orbit or almost circular orbit. So kind of hard to predict where they're going to be. It's kind of somewhere. And again, we're talking hundreds of millions of stars at this level of brightness. So which one is, is tracking it? Um, now, telescopes got a lot better between Tom, uh, Tombaugh's discovery. That's but true. But for the most part, they were bigger telescopes looking very intently at small areas of the sky. Yes. The telescopes that could map large areas didn't really progress very much no. um, from the 1930s through to the 1970s. But eventually we got progress, not so much from the telescopes, um, but from the detectors at the back end. So from you know, the mid-19th century through to you know, 1970 or thereabouts, what your bucket of light collected the light and brought it to a focal plane where there was a bit of photographic plate. That's right. And all observatories in the world, including this one, have huge <laughs> archives of <laughs> glass plates and millions you've of You've been digitising many of these yes, things. Yes, that's here. right. Um, but now we started getting digital detectors. Yes. And these were in principle much better because the photographic plate, the ones used for astronomy, typically recorded 1 to 2 percent of the light that fell on them. Okay. And that was with all sorts of special treatment called hypersensitization of plates. Uh, these digital detectors, the original ones are things like, I remember using the imaging photon counting system at the Anglo-Australian Telescope. This was a photomultiplier tube. Yeah. The trouble was if someone accidentally turns a flashlight on the dome and it explodes, that's $100,000 worth of broken glass on the bottom of your mountain. One car driving with full beam headlights down the mountain, you get bang, 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 bang from all the domes and you know, probably a million dollars worth of damage. Uh, but nowadays we use charge coupled devices. That's right. And uh, you've probably got one of those things, That's or possibly right. your Severin, in your smartphone, because these are also used for commercial cameras. That's right. Uh, we are being recorded on the camera here by a charge coupled device. Here's an astronomical one. The astronomical ones are much more expensive. They're often usually cryogenically cooled. That's right. Because they have to be very sensitive at low light levels, unlike the one in a smartphone camera. Um, but these things started coming online in the early 1990s, yep. late, late 1980s, That's right. uh, about the time I got my PhD, and they were drastically more sensitive. So they're, 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 So you said the photographic plates were only a few percent. These are... Nowadays, some of yet. these are oh. getting you know, over 99% of right. some wavelengths. They are, That's right. But it basically means the same telescope is now 99 times more powerful than it was you know, 30 or 40 years ago. This That's is right. why it's a golden age of astronomy now. It's not because us astronomers are bright. It's because we've got these amazing tools that the solid-state physicists have invented for us. That's right. So we have to thank the physicists, unfortunately. Yes. <laughs> um, Here's what these things look like. They've got an array of pixels uh, with amplifiers and the like. The way they actually work is the light, the photons of light fall onto these pixels. And yep. each pixel is like a little light bucket. That's right. Uh, so you even think of them as little light buckets and all the light that falls on one photon will collect in this bucket. 
And then you get an electronic conveyor belt that moves all these buckets to the side. So you move the charge down and then you have a second conveyor belt to the side that moves them off. And so, and then you have an amplifier that will measure how That's much right. charge is in each pixel. So normally you'd expose for some length of time, usually uh, 10, 20, 30 minutes, right. maybe up to 45 or so. Um, and then you read it out, which often could take like a minute. That's right. Um, and then you have a digital version of your image. That's right. And we had telescopes like this one um, getting bigger and on better sites, which helped it. So the telescope that I discovered the next of these Pluto-like things was on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. Compared to... Which is a lot better than uh, someone's back, backyard, back garden in Bath, which that's, Herschel discovered things. That's right. Um, and here's what um, Jewett and Lou discovered. There's their paper down there, if you want to have a look at the original discovery paper. Yep. And you've got the arrows here to indicate the dot which has moved from there to here. So yes, yeah, so it clearly has moved, and it's moved in what? Uh, not even a day. This is only yeah. a few hours. Yes, it's, so they've taken two observations of the same night, and it's moved not very far, nothing like as far as Pluto did in that. Um, these detectors back then weren't very large. They didn't right. look at small parts of the sky, but they were very sensitive, so they could see extremely faint things. Exactly. And this was the second of these Pluto-like things that was discovered. This eventually ended up with the name of Albion. So we now have two weird Pluto things out there. And this turned 92. out to be in a sort of weirdo Pluto-like orbit. Okay. 